Axiology centers itself around the concept that everything has an extrinsic and or an intrinsic value, and that often these values intersect and are often if not always related with each other. A simple primer to comprehend an axiology is that intrinsic value is basically divided by two camps. The monists who believe the only intrinsic value in anything is based upon the principle of hedonism, or the pursuit of pleasures in life, whereas the pluralists obviously see that there are many values to be derived intrinsically. Extrinsic values are those things that exist in the external world that are deemed as worthy, to which there is obvious consequential relation to the intrinsic effect that they can create. The root question that is being brought forward with all of this is whether the extrinsic and intrinsic can ever be separated from one another. When the internal value system of an individual changes, or the set of beliefs which one carries in regards to their relative moral outlook is defined, this characterizes the direction of one's actions. In other words, when the individual believes in something, they want to see the external world reflect that belief. It is not enough to hold within one's mind the ideas that have been formulated or handed down, but concrete realities must be constructed to provide visualized proof towards those ideas. The internal value of an idea is not simply a construct of invisible neurological connections, but is heralded outwardly in the expression and exaltation of these ideas. Internalized religious beliefs lead to the building of churches, cathedrals, and temples, while its founders also create elaborate systems of symbols, artwork, and external rituals that are viewed as tangible expressions of the internalized values of those beliefs. The values of the belief can now be visualized by any passerby, and this produces a physical reality of the internal worth of those values. It then becomes easier to sell the belief to others, since now there is tangible evidence that it's not just all in one's head as it might be stated. The followers of a religion become tangible expressions themselves of the same internal values being promoted, and therefore buffer the declared legitimacy about the worth of the institution and its creeds. A musician and songwriter can mentally contain notions about love, politics, friendship, the pursuit of happiness, etc. But these are meaningless to them if these concepts are not outwardly expressed lyrically and musically, while often attempting to share these musings with as many people as possible. The extrinsic value of a song is an undeniable phenomenon that can elicit profound influence upon an audience depending on many factors such as performance, emotional impact, tone, beat, tempo, genre, and obviously factors such as the physical attributes and presence of the performer themselves. Music is used as a tool in religion for this same fundamental reason, as it carries a tremendous weight of impact upon its followers. To those who have access and control over which musical content reaches the largest portions of a population, they have a means to manipulate the subjective reality in which that population begins to view what is important and valuable. If a ruler would like their subjects to think about the subject of money all day, they influentially feed to them an endless stream of songs with the concepts of money and the pursuit of wealth. If the oligarchy would like the masses to think upon sex, they manipulate the promotion of content that gives them a countless array of music and videos containing overt sexual imagery and hidden innuendo. This furthermore creates a circular effect since the musicians of the world are also exposed to this same content, and are thus prone to becoming influenced themselves, and subject to having their own internal value systems altered, which leads to them writing more songs about money, sex, and other topics related to what they have subjectively been convinced to believe are seen as the most valuable and worthy aspects in life. Since there are more musicians writing about the same topics, this widens the pool of those who will be influenced by the same factors, and the effect is compounded towards the change in value systems of more and more people. The consequence becomes inevitable. If this isn't seen as obvious, it would be suggested as one example to peruse the catalog of popular modern country music and see how many songs one can find that reference beer or other alcoholic beverages in their lyrics. Alcohol is a tool of toxicity and inebriation, 
and has always been used by the ruling class to render its citizenry into a state of docility and malleable influence. It is not a mistake that recent governmental mandates forced gyms to close while liquor stores could stay open. The facet of alcohol being used as a toxin of pleasure and a form of psychological escape from the woes of one's daily reality is simply viewed as an essential construct of a product that has been promoted as a necessary tool of socialization. The extrinsic value of alcohol is often related to the intrinsic value of one's most cherished memories with friends, family, neighbors and strangers. It may be pointed out by those who hold in high esteem the extrinsic value of alcoholic consumption that a life of strict sobriety could not offer such pleasurable intrinsic value. What does it matter if their value systems towards this product have been manipulated if they have enjoyed the product and therefore its consequences? The inherent problem with this argument is that one's experience cannot be double-sided. One's value system creates the lens through which one views their reality and this coerces one to move in certain lines of action. If one believes that the best way to have fun and enjoy life is with alcohol as their companion, then that is what will be pursued, and other methods will be seen as dead avenues that cannot possibly be as enriching. It could be asked, what is the value in a life of strict sobriety? The answer is quite obvious. Since a sober individual always carries the potential to see things through a lens of clarity, while the inebriated one is consistently clouding their judgment. The intrinsic value is inherent, and sobriety gives one the insight to see and comprehend incredibly important details, such as how an excessive amount of musical and cinematic content towards promiscuity devalues the quality of intimate human relationships. That which is devalued is cheapened until it eventually becomes worthless. There is an inflationary principle to individual qualities in life as well, and the lack of comprehension towards this often leads to a life that is squandered and traded off for shallow, evaporative pursuits instead of the search for essential meaning and substance. Think upon the amount of content that is available in the modern world, whether it be in the realm of music, social media, or cinematic entertainment. The ease in which this content is accessed is unprecedented for the population of humans at large, but what is rarely considered is the effect that the content itself has upon the hearts and minds of the individuals who are consuming it. A well-known phrase is that, we are what we eat, yet how few seem to realize that this does not only connote that which one consumes at their dinner table. What one is exposed to becomes the diet which defines the nature of one's outlook towards everything. One consumes music and its subject matter. A person consumes the violence, horror, and drama in movies and television series. If there is adoration towards certain characters, this becomes a heavy factor of influence, since there is then a proclivity towards mimicking the types of actions that the actors are portrayed as doing on screen. That's the basis of idolization, and those who control the direction of the most popular content realize its impact upon the psyche and emotional constitution of the individual. It has to be pointed out that there are individuals who believe that they can take into themselves any form of content and not be impacted in any way. Those who believe that they are too conscious to be swayed by these factors of influence are simply deluding themselves. As it might be stated, when you lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas. At every turn, a person is being baited to bite from the seemingly unlimited amount of hooks that would drag one up from the depths of their individual sanctuary to devour and manipulate as many parts of them as is possible. Any who feel that this description is too harsh and does not give enough credit to the benevolent side of this reality is still completely asleep at the wheel of their own ship. How intoxicated one can become through the consistent and steady consumption of any singular line of thinking. 
When the individual is truly sober, they see through it all, and even the subtle tactics of being baited no longer work. In this way, the hooks are not points of desire, but simply attempts to distract, and can be ignored as easily as anything else that is seductive and alluring. One of the most obvious methods that is utilized in the community of researchers is the use of fear marketing. The only thing that anyone should pay is attention to the technique itself. The operation of it is very simple. Push a story with a catchy headline and a scenario that takes the possibility of a material fear to its absolute limit or crescendo. An example would be collapse of entire nation's food supply imminent. An article or video will be made pointing to other articles and videos that indicate the plausibility of this collapse, which creates anxiety within the listeners to want to immediately do something about the situation. Certain chemicals are also released into the body, including adrenaline, which is triggering the fight or flight response. A person is ready to act now to do something about the situation. Of course, this is readily understood by those who have baited their victims, because directly after the headline presentation, and within the same article or video, the host will offer a solution to the imminent threat, which always involves buying a product from them that is related to the same issue they presented. In this case, the product will obviously be a supply of long-term food, and other products related to the physical survival of the individual during the complete and total collapse that is always going to happen tomorrow. It's always important to include the protection of the family during these promotions, as it is also readily understood that there is a deep-rooted instinctual foundational response mechanism to do anything to fend off threats when it comes to the people that live under the same roof. The examples are numerous, but the strategy is always the same. Here is the imminent collapse of a thing, and here is the product you need to buy right this instant to protect you from it. Your so-called salvation is secured. The inherent problem with all of this is that it has created a circular effect in the same way that the example with music has impacted the musicians of the world. When the value system has changed externally, the internal must follow along, which consequently leads to a wider circumference of the external being reciprocated again, and thus potentially reaching a bigger audience with each cycle. This is, titled appropriately, known as a feedback loop whereby exponentiation of growth is factored into the equation. Before the gavel of judgment comes down upon these statements, let it be made clear that this is not to say that physical preparation is frowned upon or should not be done. On the contrary, since preparation in all aspects of life should be viewed as a general necessity of continuity towards one's internal and external evolution. The issue that is being shown the light of day here is when the state of preparation is perverted into a transvaluation of suffering through the exposition of fear as opposed to the transvaluation of life. If a person truly cares about their fellow man and woman, they do not need to use such mendacious tactics to promote the sale of products to vulnerable segments of the human population. It is enough that there is so much to be scared of already, that no one needs to be further subjected to the predatory sales tactics of someone wanting to escalate their career in the promotion of fear by taking advantage of suggestible individuals who feel lost, lonely, sad, and scared of the world that they find themselves in. As strange as it may sound, there is value in the disseminated idea of collapse, which should now be obvious economically speaking. This is furthermore one of the most prescient warnings that has been shown here in previous works. Big media is the preeminent force in regards to the manipulation of axiomatic value systems in human beings. Their tactics are exactly the same as was just described, but their reach is often far wider and more surreptitious in nature. The players behind the scenes of this conglomerate understand every facet there is to comprehend about the nature of humanity as a whole, and they use every avenue at their disposal to control and manipulate the direction they would have us go as a species. This means controlling both sides of all narratives in every single way possible, since any change in a value system requires opposing sides to manifest an intended result. In the Hegelian dialectic, this is referred to as thesis, 
antithesis, and synthesis. This is what has also been meant when it was stated here that resistance is assistance. Just as in nature, both polarities need to be involved to create something new, a male and female principle. The tension that is brought forward between the opposites manifests the resolution, thus promulgating continuity otherwise described as the extension or X-tense ion cord. The narrative currently that is being hammered day in and day out is between the polarities of pro-vaxxer versus anti-vaxxer, and the intention behind this narrative is to eventually wring out humanity on the other side of it into a new world order of the ages. The entire internal and external value systems of health, wellness, freedom, and prosperity have been boiled down into taking the bodily injection of a singular product that is being called a vaccine. It is not difficult to discern that such a singular and myopic viewpoint in regards to these vastly complex and incredibly important human systems of life is suspect to say the very least. Regardless of which side one finds themselves on in regards to this issue, it is evident that the friction necessary to move this agenda forward is now prevalent in society, which is the fundamental reason that the aspect of neutrality has been talked about so often. The message of it was never meant for a massive audience, since to generalize, most are simply not even ready to hear it, let alone work towards its merits. Fixing the problems of this world is akin to fitting the ocean inside of a cup. Since this is impossible, the individual is instead tasked with realizing that they contain all of the properties of the universe inside of themselves. Hence, in this analogy, the cup is the ocean, albeit in miniature. We are not here to fix the problems of the world. We are here to fix the problems within ourselves. That is enough. And one can take solace in the fact that it is enough. The response to every situation that one finds themselves in becomes the test that puts one's heart on the scales of Anubis. Regardless of the collateral damage one may have to contend with, or even the terrible situations that back one into a corner. It is emphasized here again why sobriety is not only important, but essential. Psychological tactics are consistently utilized by big media and the tech conglomerates to funnel the value systems of the human population in singular directions. And one of the primary techniques that is utilized is to give their audiences aphoristic statements which often contain notes of condescension and hints of mockery. These maxims are simple, and are repeated like religious mantras day after day, month after month. A blatant example is, anti-vaxxers are conspiracy theorists. More recently, one that is being trumpeted is, a conspiracy theorist is someone who does their own research. The more juvenile the axiom, the more easily it becomes digested by the audience, which then trains the mind into changing the structure of its internal value system. 
The restructuring of these values, in turn, leads to the external actions of compliance towards governmental authority and a verbalized and reactionary hatred towards those who are not following suit. These big media tactics are forms of dark magic and carry sinister karmic repercussions. This is why those on the anti-vaxxer side that utilize the same tactics to promote their products by advertising fear 24-7 are in essence not doing any better work regardless of any perceived intention. Fox News is a good example of big media trying to falsely situate themselves in the middle of the situation with an obvious bent towards right-wing conservative politics. The hosts and guests that are brought on will talk about the need for transparency and the protection of individual freedoms, but all of them will state for the record that they are not anti-vax and in fact have gotten their COVID vaccine. The subtlety and mendacious aspect of this tactic is obvious, since most of the people presented are highly educated, well-spoken, and successful individuals in society. So this puts the seed of doubt in individuals who have found their way to this content that may not trust the authorities in regards to this whole situation, along with the authoritative push towards injecting oneself with experimental pharmaceutical substances. The logic being eaten is that if all these intelligent and freedom-loving individuals have gotten the vaccine, then maybe I should too. It may be thought, perhaps there really is nothing to be concerned about. This is why the axiology of all value systems requires its thesis and antithesis. Thus from this, it might be understood why a light is also turned towards this channel as well when stating to unsubscribe from here too. Authority must come from within. To create a transvaluation of values towards life, one must undergo an inward apocalypse of all former value systems that have been set up for them by others, and rebuild from those ashes in phoenix-like manner the sovereign kingdom which is not influenced by anyone who wishes to take advantage and sway the direction of the true guide which each one of us carries within ourselves. What is value? What is worthy of one's time and attention? These are not simple questions, nor are they meant to be. Contemplation seems to be something that should be worthy of that time and attention, yet who makes the effort to contemplate much of anything? When one is constantly seeking out entertainment and pleasure, the hours, days, and even years of time that it requires to think and meditate effectively and immensely upon even a single concept seems to be a frivolous pursuit, empty in its results, and something only a foolish person would waste their life upon. This, however, comes from the vacuity of a mind that is inebriated from the toxic effects of a human world hell-bent on destroying itself. As Krishnamurti stated, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. When we lie down in a world of dogs, we all come up with fleas. Does this mean one's response is to run away from society altogether? Not at all. It simply means that the responsible individual chooses to walk in a different light among their fellow man and not lie down with them. Becoming a better individual does not condescend anyone else. It simply means one has made the only decision worth making, the choice to elevate themselves, to walk the narrow path instead of the broad way. Falling is easy, but rising takes a magnitude of effort that practically seems mythological. One is then swimming upstream against the currents of the majority. How does this equate in this civilization at present that is going through such volatile change both internally and externally. The first thing is to realize that every equation goes both ways. This equals that, while inversely that equals this. Those are the camps. But who are the ones sitting on the equal sign itself? 
observing within themselves the fight between the polarities that is playing out. The symbol of the equal sign is truly a two-way street, and all games require opposition. Until one can love their enemy, their love remains but half of its potential, and is therefore divided and is not love at all. Why has it not ever been understood? Love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Love as a legitimate quality cannot choose to be on only one side of the equation. This has led to the comprehension that one finds out who their real friends are when the chips are down, so to speak. A person has the opportunity to realize who they truly are not when things are easy, but only when they become difficult. This is the true litmus test. The equation of this is viewed in an observable trend taking place all around the world. Can one be against the current measures of discrimination and yet simultaneously be a participant in them in any capacity? The value of authenticity requires that one's thoughts, words, and actions must be in alignment with one another. When thoughts and actions are disjointed, this leads to a segregation of the individual which becomes a manifest expression of disharmony, an insimilitude to anything musical that is out of tune, the proper keys are not attained, and therefore the metaphorical and literal doors towards authenticity in life remain closed. The keys to heaven's gates are locked. A direct example of this is found in the perceived extrinsic value of obtaining a vaccine passport, which in many jurisdictions around the world allows the one who has inoculated themselves with these certain experimental pharmaceutical juices to then be given a style of VIP treatment to the things in society that were recently accessible to everyone regardless of any so-called medical status. The extrinsic value of obtaining the passport leads to the intrinsic value of pleasure through the enjoyment of public services, the ability to sit down in restaurants and pubs, go to the gym, salon, travel on airplanes, etc. Anything deemed as non-essential, and even in some places now, this has moved to the essential. Those who do not conform like cattle are ostracized and treated like pariah. Of course, it will be pointed out that at this moment, there are variations of these measures in different areas, but the pattern of the direction that this agenda is moving is blatantly obvious, and the forces behind it will not cease moving forward with their mandates until they have everyone bow down before their altar. That is their intention and mindset. The so-called solution of a passport inherently becomes the next problem. Antithesis formulates the next thesis of the agenda, which then moves onward to the following antithesis. In leapfrog fashion, the entire world is moved herd-like in a specific and intentional direction, all through the constant manipulation of the individual value systems and what is deemed as the most important issues in one's life. Those who are angered by the ones not following along with the trend are simply venting their own frustration at a choice they subconsciously comprehend is inharmonious with the balance of life itself. As it has been said, a house that is divided will fall. The house that is humanity is now ultimately divided against itself and is set up to fall, and those who feel that they are insulated from this inevitable reality are stupefied by the mockery in which their lives have been restructured into. The house wasn't on fire, but the public became convinced that it was, and then instead of calling in the fire department, the public was told that it was in their best interest to hire arsonists. The obvious consequence being, that the very threat that they were told to fear eventually became the legitimate reality. On top of that, the public was further convinced that while the arsonists were busy doing their work, the fire department should also be fired to prevent any actual help from ever arriving. No pun intended. Those who exist in a perpetual state of fear command ignorance, because to admit ignorance would be to destroy the totality of one's own world. This is why revelation is associated with apocalypse, meaning to reveal and disclose, since it is the complete and total collapse of ignorance, 
and the structures of one's former perceptions are utterly destroyed. On the surface, there is no apparent value in doing this to oneself, so the ideals and notions that a person carries with them and that have been built up over time or recently through the channels of fear are protected and guarded in the same way that cherished physical items and property are. Who wants to mentally start from scratch? To be born again, so to speak. It must be pointed out here that this does not indicate an erasure of practical knowledge one has gained, but is linked with the conceptualization of that which is esteemed as subjectively valuable. The mind that believes itself to be complete is truly finished. Life is movement and vibration, and truth is in alignment with this principle. Alignment provides balance, and in relation to the topic of discrimination, one may hold the belief that they do not want to participate in actions of discrimination, but the participation itself holds the key to their own symmetry, and therefore when thought and action are not directly related, there is conflict. With conflict, the consequence is pain, and that pain is consistent and enduring until resolution is found. Pain is always about separation, while the opposing aspect of pleasure is about integration. If resolution and healing do not occur, the wounds of division become more infected, and the foundations that kept one's house in order begin to crumble. This was the prevailing meaning behind the symbol of 9-11, and also the perfect vision of 2020. The two houses or twins of humanity that are divided will be taken down, and from their ashes they will build a new world. One world. One eye. One vision. The single eye of providence. A world built upon the foundational doctrines and value systems of the hidden one, that is known as the bearer of light, Lucifer. History might be written by the victor, but actions reverberate, and the circles of reality always complete themselves.